Good afternoon all. Thank you for giving up your lunchtime to come and learn all about timber. I'm Tabitha Binding, Head of Education and Engagement at Timber Development UK. And I'd like to welcome you to webinar two, which is the first in a series of seven webinars. This series aims to add to your engineering education so that as we transition to a bio-based economy, you have the tools and knowledge to include timber within the projects you work on, whether they're new build or the reuse of existing buildings and retrofits. So Timber Development UK has formed from the merger of two of the largest and longest established organisations in the supply chain the Timber Trade Federation, the TTF, and the Timber and Research and Development Association, which we all know as TRADA. So we are seeking as an organization to connect the supply chain, to lead best practice, and accelerate towards a low carbon future, of which obviously timber plays a big part. But our plea to you as engineers is to learn to understand timber and to use it wisely and well. And if you don't, uh, you know, or you have further questions, I was going to say if you don't know what you're doing, which is a bit rude, but if you, um, you know, if you have questions, then please come and ask us. We are connected to lots of people who will put you, point you in the right direction. So today our speakers are Alid Davis from Cardiff University and Gavin Knowles from the University of Bath. And this session will give an overview of the flexurial design of solid section timber joists and beams with restrained and unrestrained zones respectively, including associated checks on shear, including bearing strength and deflection analysis. A worked example will highlight key assumptions, signpost design code clauses and suggest further reading. Now we've put the series together as a Zoom meeting so that you can be interactive, you can ask questions. If you'd like to paste your questions in the chat box, um, Gavin will answer them after he's given his presentation. And so with that, I'm going to stop sharing screen and ask Gavin to start sharing and presenting. Gavin, all yours. Thanks, Tavs. Okay. Okay, here we okay. go then. So webinar two, Timber and Flexure. And if I oh, for some reason I can't move yeah. my uh go down to the <laughs> sorry. Yeah. sorry, hold on a minute. Let me just share that again and let me share it there and then let me go to full screen. Now we're we're in business, right? Okay, so um, uh, th so thank you, Tabitha, for inviting me and, and Ali to speak uh, regarding this. So uh, I must first uh, send apologies from Ali, who is a reader at Cardiff University. He can't be with us today, unfortunately, but I just want to give a shout out to him that obviously he was very involved in this presentation and developing it alongside me. Um, it's just that holidays get got in the way but so <laughs> Ali, I hope you're enjoying your holiday but um, anyway we're hopefully you're in safe hands so I'm uh, just to give a really quick background synopsis of me I'm a lecturer at the University of Bath um, I'm chartered engineer I've, I've spent most of my time in in uh, in practice and I've designed with timber uh, over my time quite a lot actually as a as a chartered engineer so my previous work was across many fields, including kind of new build and refurbishment. And, um, and, and obviously my passion really around timber was built from designing things like schools out of timber and CLT and glue lamb. Um, and now I'm fortunate enough to sort of teach it. And I teach mainly project work. I teach Eurocode 
so I'm sort of doing this as my my normal day job is uh, doing <laughs> is is teaching um, sort of timber in in all in all forms. So um, so anyway, we're gonna we're gonna look work through um, a, an example of of timber of a timber beam. We're gonna look at a joist, and we're also gonna think about its restraint positions and things. But just to start off with, I just thought I'd, as a as a bit of a teaser, I suppose is kind of we probably are all here because we're quite passionate about the visual uh, interest that timber gives us um and i think in the if you were at the previous uh, talk um by by Alid and david um they had some really nice slides of different kind of case studies but this is a really nice case study that stands out to me as a um, kind of uh, the the sort of exposed nature of timber that you can get and a lot of the time obviously when we're talking about things like roof joists, which you can see here, um, often they're hidden away, but they've decided, the architects decided to kind of expose them here. Um, and what the engineer has kind of facilitated that by looking at sort of pairing up longer spans. So thinking about where the loads are going, you've got kind of these shared roof joists that are um, sh quite shallow in their formation, spanning between these, these long span doubled up timbers. So, trying to make the, the structure work very efficiently. Um, so I just like this as, a, as, as an example of that, of how this works and the honesty of it as well, that uh, you can kind of see it and it's quite raw. And you can see things like where the connections are, um, where the beam sits on the columns and things like that. So it's just, a, just quite a nice example, I think. And then kind of moving on from that, from that kind of softwood version, we obviously, we talked, I think last week, there was some talk around kind of the different types of um, of, of timber. And obviously here we're looking at uh, a glue lamb medium. So this is much more kind of multi-story. The previous image was of a single story building, but the function of timber working on multi-story levels is obviously very capable. It's very capable of, of doing that. Um, and obviously within any timber elements, you th need to think about durability and fire and obviously even durability during its kind of construction phasing. And I think in the following series, seven sets of series, might get a nod from Tabitha here, but there we'll, we'll kind of cover durability um, later on. There you go, thumbs up, thank you Tabs. Um, and so here you can see the kind of facilitation of um, you know, the simple kind of construction methods used, small crane here to lift parts in, and these beams are being lifted in and dropped directly on top of the column. So there's a really nice kind of bearing connection going on. And we'll talk about um, bearing and do some sums on that in a bit. Um, also connections, you know, already connected into those timber beams, ready to kind of receive uh, the, the, the kind of that secondary uh, beam as well. Um, Actually, what would be great, I've got my pointer here, I can do that as well. So yeah, these these kind of connections ready to kind of receive the actual beams. So a sort of overall general principle when we're talking about our structure and, and alluding towards Eurocode is we need to think about um, the Eurocode obviously uses limit state design. And when it comes to timber, um, we need to think about its ultimate limit state um, for strength. So we need to test uh, our beam for strength under the ultimate limit state loadings. And then when we look at deflection and vibration, we're looking at serviceability limit state. So sort of unfactored um, uh, load loadings. So just bear that in mind in terms of our loadings approach. It's very similar to steel work and concrete. Um, historically, when we were working to British standards, uh, years ago, we we did permissive stresses and things, but with Eurocode, we're looking at these two states, and we obviously need to check for those two states when we're analysing a timber uh, beam or a column or whatever it is in timber. So, the sort of general format for today then is to kind of think around this sort of setup on the page here. I've got some written text on the right hand side, which alludes to. Um, some of the detail and, and, and the code and the watch it's. And then on the left-hand side, we're kind of going to walk through uh, an example. So that's generally the setup for the slides as we work through it. So I'm going to kind of go to the right-hand side and then I'm going to dash over to the left-hand side. And we're kind of going to talk about one, 
and then we're going to do do one. So it's a real kind of it's a classic. There's a classic saying in, in surgery, in, in medical surgery, that when you're a surgeon to get up to that position, you kind of need to um, kind of watch surgery and then you actually sort of get involved with it. So you learn about the theory, you watch one and then you do one. And I think engineering is very much like that as well. So that's the reason for the, the kind of setup that we're looking at. So we need to consider permanent loads. Um, so we know that we've got, you know, uh, if we take the action of something like this, these, these timber floorboards that we're looking at and these timber joists, this kind of classical setup of a floor, um, we need to think about its dead weight, the load that's actually acting on those, on those uh, floor joists. And the example that we're going to take is, is a floor joist today. So you need to think about the build-ups classically like you would do with any uh, material that you're designing. So in this situation, on a quite sort of domestic level, we'd be looking at carpets, we'd be looking at floorboards. You need some sort of action for services, and then there may be some ceiling as well. Um, and then a kind of a, a judgment on self weight of joists. If these joists are set at sort of 400 centers, 600 centers, which is a kind of classic set out for a floor plate, we'd be looking at the joist uh, all up some of, of 0.2 kilonewtons per meter squared. So we're thinking about these actions being applied for single square meterage. Um, so just to calculate an action uh, uh, per joist, so we want to look at our joist. We've got a nominal span, and we'll, talk, we'll, we'll give uh, a number to this in a minute. And we know that we've got this kind of universal distributed load on top. Um, we need to think about how uh, what our joist is. So we're going to take a punch at 250 deep by 75 joists, and these joists are sitting at 400 centers. Um, and we do need to, to think about this joist being is it restrained or unrestrained? Now, in this situation where we're fixing something to the top compression flange or compression edge, we know that that's restrained and we're not going to get any lateral torsional buckling. And the kind of ratio of, of this uh, joist enables it to be um, not too deep and thin, which is obviously not what we want because we get a kind of chance for it to buckle. So we've we've made some assumptions on that, and we said that we've nailing we're nailing all of the um, boards, uh, floorboards to the actual joist. And this is the example we're going to use. We're going to take the loading of the of the board uh, floorboard onto that um, onto that joist. We're taking a C16 member, so that's C for coniferous. It's from a coniferous plant, so it's so it's spruce, so it's a softwood. Okay. So it's going to be D deciduous if it's a if it's a hardwood like an oak or something. So we've got some density here. We've got 370 kilograms per meter cubed. Um, so the loading, we, we, we're suggesting that a board is 0.15 kilonewtons per meter squared. And what we're going to do is we're plugging that into, we're looking at the size, the geometric size. So it's 0.25 meters by uh, 0.075 for its width times this 3.7 because we're converting that 370 kgs into, into kilonewtons. Uh, we're going to add the load. So that's the self-weight load of the joist. And then we're going to add in the self-weight load of the board. And we're going to times that, obviously, by 0.4 so that we get a kilonewton per meter. And our kilonewton per meter for, a, for the permanent load is 0.13 kilonewtons per meter per joist. We've got an imposed loading, so a, or, or sorry, a variable load, we should call it for your uh, for Eurocode. Eurocode speak. So uh, that applied action, we're looking at this uh, this member being in an office. So most of you will know that an office loading is 2.5 kilonewtons per meter squared. So again, that 2.5 kilonewtons uh, per meter squared is spread between those 400 centers. So we're we're taking on uh, a variable load of 2.5 kilonewtons per meter squared times 0.4 meters, and we're getting one kilonewton per meter. So we've got this self weight load of 0.13 and we've got one for our variable loads. Okay, now if we add that up, we, so our ser service limit state, our SLL is obviously 1.1. And if we look at, well, we said when we're looking at strength, we need to justify the timber for ultimate limit state. So we need to apply those factors and those Euro code factors are classically for permanent load is 1.35. So that's why we've got this 1.35 here on our permanent and uh, 1.5 for our variable load. So all uploading is 1.7 kilonewtons per meter. So that's our that's our W, our UDL that's spanning across. Now, 
when it comes to the length of the joist, the effective span, just over on the right hand side here, you see these little sketches. By the way, these aren't my sketches, these are Alid's sketches, and they're fantastic. And, uh, you know, uh, I think I think a picture says a thousand words and his drawings are fantastic. So thank you, Alid. Um, think about where does your timber bear? How does it bear? So does it sit on a joist hanger? Therefore, its load or its support reaction is going to be about the midpoint of that of that hanger. So that's going to determine your your effective length. If you're um, bearing completely central on a on a column or on a wall, then obviously we're going to take it to the midpoint there. It's it's kind of uh, a kind of loose uh, exercise in in understanding your effective length. Um, bending moments then WF squared upon eight. Uh, we plug in our numbers again into that, and we've got a bending moment max of almost five kilonewton meters. Um, so in in, our, in terms of um, Euro code notation, we look at MYD, so it's our design uh, bending about the Y axis. Um, remember, we've got our, uh, our Y axis acting uh, as the major axis, so the deep axis, and obviously our M for moment. Um, so looking at uh, shear force, so that's going to be interesting when we come to looking at shear. So we're going to do a bending check and we're going to do a shear check, but these are our applied loads. So WL over two, um, we get 4.1 kilonewtons. So at each side, support side, we've got four on the edge of four kilonewtons that are being applied. OK, so what do we need to do then? We need to look at what is the bending stress. So, so what is the stress of our that's acting uh, with those loadings, with those moments? So to do that, the Eurocode gives us um, a, a kind of classical engineering equation of the moment over the section modulus. So WY is our section modulus, that's our geometric properties, that's based on the size of our member. So uh, to find that is just B, uh, BH squared over six. So H obviously is our depth, H um, being height, that's how Eurocode refers to, to the depth of the section. Um, so we've got our plug in play again, into that and then we get um, 781 times 10 to the 3 millimeters cubed in terms of our section modulus. So we're going to take that number and we're going to plug it into our w, uh, WY and we've already found out our bending uh, moment that's in the that's in that section and so we can find out our bending stress. We've got the two things we just do one over the over the other and we get 6.3 newtons per millimeter squared. So that's a number that we need to hold on to because that's what's being applied to our beam. Um, then when it comes to um, looking at our applied shear stress, we need to think about, OK, what's happening with that member? And what we have with that member is we have um, a distribution of shear across the beam um, with the maximum uh, amount of shear somewhere in, in the middle there. So our uh, tau max is three over two times VD over BH, where, where VD obviously is that shear that we worked out in the previous uh, slide. Um, so just jumping back, uh, the, the, the shear that's being applied is 4.1 kilonewtons. OK, so let's look at that then, the applied shear stress. Taking that Eurocode formula, we can plug in that 4.1 in terms of our VD. And what we're interested here is the is the area of what uh, where where is that shear that shear is acting over that area of that beam now um interestingly enough with with timbers they can split they 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 can have localized cracking on the outer edges of those members and if you can imagine if it's split then it's not really going to work in that shear um position it's not really going to transfer the forces in the same way. So we make some um, uh, Eurocode gives us a little bit of guidance on that and says, well, you should take sort of two thirds of the area to account for that or, or two thirds of the breadth. Sorry. So that that overall section doesn't affect the moment. The moment can still work because all of those tabs. I don't know if you can give me a thumbs up, but can you see me and can you see my I've I've got a load of straws here. Um, that are kind of acting as my as my piece of tree, as it's sort of water going up and 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 uh, helping the foliage. But basically, if we take the the idea of the beam um, and we've got 
the outer ones could get that crack in it. You've got those long linear pieces that in the moment situation, uh, those little cracks aren't really going to affect it. But if we come to shear and it's got this shear situation, those can those can affect it and you can get this shearing and sliding past. So um, we need to allow for that effectively. Now, um, so doing that means that we take, um, we've got to times everything by 0.67 and that's our KCR value. So this is a K value. We're going to introduce some K values as we work through the analysis. Okay. So we can find, you can find that in, um, in EC5, uh, 6.13, equation 6.13a is where you want to look for that. Um, so that is that. The important thing to think about is then we're going to think about the strength now and how we, um, so we've looked at what's, what's loading the beam and how's the, how's the beam kind of, what are the loads and the induced stresses in that beam. What we're going to say now is we're actually going to look what, what's the resistive um, strength um, in, that, um, in that beam. So we need to think about well, how, what is the strength of our, of our member and what things are going to affect our strength. And the things that we can affect our strength are called modification, modification factors, modification factors. Why is that so hard to, to say? Sorry. Um, but, the, um, but the strength, uh, the bending strength we can find from um, the uh, standard publications here on the, here on the uh, right hand side. Um, and if we open up that book here, we've got the strength classes in table one. And what we're interested in is the bending strength properties of our different classes of timber. So along the top here, where I've got my pointer, we're looking at our C values. We know that we've got a C16 um, grade beam. Now in a floor, if we've got a typical kind of joist layout uh, of this scale, we'd probably be looking at C16s. If we've got a much sort of heavier situation uh, with a higher variable load, um, or, or even higher permanent loads, maybe, maybe it's the floor of a gallery or something, you might want to jump to a much higher strength timber straight away. So you might want to look at C24s straight away. And obviously the values of those um, bending, why we call them that is that their bending strength aligns with it. So the C18 has an 18 um, Newton per millimeter squared value for its strength, for its bending strength. So as you can see here, we can kind of plug, um, we can extrapolate this formula to be a, a series of modifications factors as a reduction or an enhancement against the um, strength. Times the strength divided by gamma m, which is a material safety factor. So we're allowing for some safety. As engineers, you know we all like a little bit of safety factor. Material safety factor is obviously critical. So, um, so for um, softwood, uh, so for our for our situation here, we can kind of jump into this uh, table, which is part of the EC5 guide. Um, this uh, this is by the Astra E, but um, all guides are uh, similar to this in terms of gamma gamma M's. The solid timber is 1.3 uh, for a material safety factor. Now, if you're looking at glue lamb, you can see kind of just stepping down here. Uh, because glue lamb, you've reduced the amount of um, kind of natural issues that are in a solid timber uh, member that's just been cut down from a tree. The glue lamb, because you're kind of cutting out some of that um, no no uh, notional uh, failure or, or, or notional um, uh, problems with the timber, uh, you can get an enhancement on the uh, material safety factor. So the material safety factor is is basically 1.25, slightly less than 1.3. Um, so that's just one to note. So what are these modification factors? There's there's kind of four things to, to drop down, which uh, effectively get called K values or modification factors. So one size, um, a load duration and moisture on strength. Uh, I know that um, I think David and Ali alluded to that in the, in, in the series last week. Um, so we'll, we'll, I'll draw out on that in a, in a minute. There's a size effect factor, there's a load sharing factor, and there's a lateral torsional buckling factor as well. So, uh, so Eurocode kind of uh, alludes to using those modification factors against those uh, bending strengths. Um, 
so what happens i suppose really to think about this to take a step back now what when we're looking at loading duration you've got to think about what a tree is doing in in real life and and sort of apply that thing we're cutting this thing down and using it and turning it on its side and we're making it into a beam or we're using it like it grew and we're using it as a column so uh, the way that the load in parts on trees obviously kind of gives us a sense of what loading duration happens so permanent its self weight is always there um, there are going to be some variable loads on it so there's going to be wind acting on it on that tree and the tree grows knowing that that wind's going to happen and it has uh, a resilience for a kind of short gusting of, of of wind in theory and so there there is some sort of enhancement around that to think about um, well, if we apply the wind, actually, it's probably only going to work for a short amount of time. So um, when we look at that, I suppose, if you if you kind of think about the, the duration of the, the, the load that's acting on that member, if it lasts for a long time, the bending stress as a percentage of the test value will go down. Um, and if it's only there for a very short amount of time, so a real gust or a real, uh, you know, snow, loading or uh, wind loading it can be quite instantaneous and therefore um, we don't get ma a massive strength reduction factor and on that as well thinking around uh, uh, sort of dura like we mentioned durability and obviously timber getting wet obviously timber softens so if you get some saturation you're obviously going to lose some of the strength and so thinking about moisture content of your um, timber uh, when when it's being used is really critical and obviously in a in a typical uh, kind of uh, enclosed situation you're going to you're going to want your timbers down at 10 percent 12 percent that sort of level um, durability exposure classes we call service classes um, and we need to think about what that uh, what what exposure that timber is going to come under under its lifetime so therefore um, things like cold roofs are a worse situation than warm roofs. So uh, a service class one is given for warm roofs and a service class two is given for cold roofs. And then, you know, you can go all the way down to service class three, where you've got maybe that beams in a, in a situation where it's externally be, being used externally and it's, it is fully exposed. Or maybe it's actually it's, it is being used externally but it's got some sort of protection from direct weathering so it's got a little bit of canopy on it or something and so it's still getting all of that thermal um, uh, attack in a way um, but so it's reduced slightly down to a service class two so it's really critical that we think about you know where our timbers is going to happen and what sort of load reductions we need to in, uh, account for so um, again, values from table 3.1 in EC5, there's this really handy table that looks at what material we've got. So solid timber, glue lime, LVL. As we're just sort of dabbling in solid timber at the moment, let's come across to service classes in solid timber. We're looking between one and two. And then we need to think about our duration of that loading. Now, if we jump down to this, uh, to the descriptions down at the bottom of the page, we can see durations and you can see that the descriptions is kind of runs from permanent long term down to instantaneous so when i was talking about that tree that wind impact effectively is noted as an instantaneous um, situation which just occurs very rapidly um, whereas if we're looking at short term we're looking at snow and roof access which is less than a week what we're looking at for this example is a floor plate. So we've got imposed floor loading um, and that's classified as a medium term load duration class. So let's jump up to the table. You can see that the load duration class for medium is, is 0.8. So whenever we're doing analysis on uh, timbers, we need to think about the load combinations of all these kind of short terms and instantaneous medium terms. We need to play a little bit with um, those combinations and we need to take the worst case situation um, so the, the and to see which one will drive the design for the simplicity of today we're just keeping it uh, as a as a typical imposed floor load we've only got one variable load size effect factor as well is really important so um, we're when we think about a timber and think about 
that timber being cut and put on its side, you may have these imperfections. Um, and you can think about the timber being a, a sort of chain of links. And obviously, if you've got um, a much deeper section here on the right hand side, which is a much longer chain, it's got more links to break in the series. If you've got a much shallower, uh, a much shallower beam, it's potentially got less problems with it, less, less, less links in the chain to break. So therefore, if you've got um, if you've got a smaller beam element, we can we can take some enhancement basically on our strength class because we potentially might not have as many knots and fissures and problems with it as for the much uh, taller beam. I hope that's a good. Uh, uh, I fe feasible idea on what we're doing, but basically just cut, really that's simplifying uh, what the Eurocode tells us. So the Eurocode basically tells us that a a standard size softwood timber is based on a 150 deep. If we're shallower than 150, we can play and get some enhancement, and we can get a higher kh value. So this material size effect factor is called kh. Um, if for our member, we're saying that it was 225 deep. So actually, we, we're not going to get in any enhancement and our KH number is going to be one or we can ignore, we're sort of ignoring it, basically. Um, but if we were working with joists that were 100 deep, then what you would do is you would plug in 100 for your H value down here and you would look to see that that sum was higher or lower than the 1.3 and you would take the minimum. And so at minimum, you might get um, you know, you might get an, in if this was 1.5, you would take the 1.3 as the biggest bit of enhancement. So you can see we would apply that to the strength grade, the, the strength of the timber, and it would enhance the strength a little bit. Same goes for, for glue lamb, but the glue lamb um, is 600 deep as a starting point, as a gauge. And obviously, if you're smaller than that 600, again, you can, in, you can employ that kind of enhancement. Uh, but again, it's, it can't go sort of any higher than, than the 1.1. Um, it's obviously based on that minimum. So you don't get as much enhancement out of the glue now. And, and I suppose really in some way, a lot of the kind of fissures and issues have been kind of cut out in the process of looking at that glue lamb and finger jointing the best parts together to make that glue lamb. Um, load sharing is really important. So obviously with our floor that we, we've uh, sh that I've shared with you, you can get an enhancement by um, that floorboard is going to divide up the load when someone stands on it. And the timbers, within that kind of floor plate, some might be stronger than others, and you can kind of play on using some of those higher strength timbers to enhance you. So that's just an enhancement of 1.1 in that situation. A good example of is, is, is not just a floor joist, but of also a, a wall as well. So timber stud wall, you can see here that you've got all these members kind of sharing out the load with the OSB, covering over the top. And so one of these, these um, studs, may well be a little bit stronger than the one that it sits next to and it kind of plays with the, the with the risk of that or the enhancement of that a little bit um so lateral torsional buckling can happen so like i said at the very up upstart of this i said we were fixing the the um we were restraining the compression edge of that timber the top edge when it goes into bending it's going to be in compression it could fail and it could twist um so obviously we have a value for that it's called k crit um, and typically in a restrained situation, we would take uh, K crit as one. So it's not affecting our, our answer. Um, and we can, um, that can occur for unrestrained timber beams if, uh, as long as the compressive edge is restrained. So that's the nailing or the fixing of something to it. Um, that the torsional restraints that supports is prevented, so it can't rotate at the support as well, or the member depth to breadth ratio is less than five to one. So that's a bit of a kind of rule of thumb, really. But looking at your your kind of when you start out looking at a standard joist, um, just be mindful of that kind of ratio. Um, lateral torsional buckling is a, a risk, uh, is a risk, then you need to calculate K crit. So when you're looking at something a lot sort of more slender, then it should be already alarm bells ringing on it to kind of uh, think about how that works and how that's going to influence the bending strength. Um, just to then jump back to the philosophy of, um, so we've talked about modification factors. We're now going to kind of plug in some numbers into our real 
um, into our real job. Uh, factors to consider, we've talked about KH, the height of the section, um, it's less than one, uh, it's less than 150 actually, so we're not going to get any enhancement, it's going to be a one. So on the left hand side here, you can see our design bending strength is made up of these K modification factors and our bending strength, which we can get out of that table one. That's going to be 16. Um, K crit is one, we just said that. K mod is our modification class, so service class and load duration. I pointed out on the tables earlier that we've got a kind of class one service, service class. We've got a medium term condition because we've got our kind of variable floor load acting um, as the lead variable. And then we've got 0 0.8 as, as a modification. So you can see that's going to reduce our overall strength slightly. But what uh, then we can do is we can enhance our strength by this case list, this load sharing between timbers. So that's 1.1. So let's jump and plug all of that into our analysis and we get 10.8 newtons per millimeter squared and enhance that's that's higher than what was being uh, what stress the timber was under that so it's under 6.3 newtons per millimeter squared so we know that that beam is strong enough to take that bending we do exactly the same with our uh, shear strength so we're taking um the shear strength um the characteristic shear strength of the member fvk k4 characteristic v for shear and then we're applying our modification factors. Now, do note that we haven't got a KH involved in this one. Um, we've just got our K mod and our K system. We haven't got our K crit because we're not worried about the, the, the buckling at the shear at the shear position. So um, we again just put numbers into that, and we find out that our design shear strength is 2.2 newtons per millimeter squared, and that's greater than 0.49. Um, so we're all right for shear. And again, FVK comes from that table one. All right. So you can, you can get that out of there. Um, okay. Um, and then I've just, I've just highlighted those, um, those bending parallel to the grain is 16 newton per meter. And then your shear parallel to the grain is 3.2. So that's just the numbers that we plug in. And that's all from BSEN 338 table one. OK, so we've analysed the bending and the shear, and that's OK. We're going to jump into kind of deflection. Um, we all know that to take up load, the beam has to deflect an, an amount. Um, we get a series of different types of deflection depending on, on, on loading and depending on time as well. So um, the thing to note with timber is it's a little bit like concrete. It's going to creep in time. It's going to deflect and it's not really going to return to its actual elastic uh, effect. So it will creep. Um, so a, a good example of creep, if you think about your kitchen um, cupboards at home, if you put lots of tins on those shelves, over time, the shelf kind of bends and distorts uh, over a long period of time, and you get that distortion, and that's really the timber creep creeping over time. Um, that's my simplest way of explaining that. Um, so you, what we can do in terms of um, getting an overall deflection is we need to think about that instantaneous deflection, and we need to think about that creep deflection as well. So we can do a series of things to counteract some of that deflection. We can, we can pre-camber. So we can pre-camber for the amount that this thing's going to move instantaneously under uh, permanent load. So um, that's uh, what we would call uh, our WC value. And then we get an instantaneous deflection due to permanent variable loads, which is this W instantaneous. So it moves from the pre-cambered all the way down to, an, to a nominated point, which we can work out. Um, and then you get a little bit of kind of long-term, this long-term creep, which also builds up a, a, a different deflection um, form. form. Um, and so you can get this kind of total uh, final deflection under the permanent and, and, and variable loads, which is our W fin, which is going, going from the pre-camber all the way down to the overall deflection. But if we take out the pre-camber, say we get an actual a, a sort of net finished deflection, which is what we're probably interested in at the end of the day, because that's what's going to affect our finishes. That's going to what's going to affect whatever's sitting uh, and relating to that uh, timber. May it be soft finishes, plasterboard that could crack. That's what we, we're interested in in this situation. So um, deflection, 
we need to consider that it arises from flexure and shear. So um, differently to steelwork, when we're designing steelwork, we're generally thinking about deflection due to flexure in timber because shear is quite an important part that makes up kind of five to 20% of the total deflection. We need to add in shear deflection as well. So we're checking both flexure and shear deflections. Um, and what we're using is also is where, because it's not the strength grading, so we're not taking a 5% strength grading, we're just taking the mean Young's modulus. So E for mean is the important bit to take. And we're analyzing the structure under service limit states. So as I, my first, uh, one of my earlier slides was saying, when we analyze the beam, we analyze it for ULS state, for its strength, and then in the deflection state, we're interested in service limit state, so unfactored loads. So we're going to plug in unfactored permanent and variable loads. Um, and we're also using the mean shear modulus, so that's G mean. And again, those uh, numbers for E mean and G mean can come out of that um, British Standard Table, Table 1. Um, another thing to introduce you to is another K value. Like we, d we haven't got enough K values already. Here's another one, okay? So, so K def is related to the long-term creep. Um, and you can see that depending on its exposure class, um, that, D that K def can actually increase the deflection. So for a, a service class one, we apply uh, a multiplier of 0 0.6. So, um, and for a service class three, we, we apply a multiplier of two. So it's going to, if in, in effect, deflect more. So you can see why a, a sort of wet, a wet timber in a service class three situation might deflect by a lot more. Um, OK, so what we're interested in then is we've got to get some values to plug into our equations. And the deflection equation is exactly like the steelwork equation for deflection. So general engineering principles here, we've got um, five WL cu uh, cubed over 384EI as our um, analysis for deflection. I value, um, which is our second moment of area, is just a geometric property, PD cubed upon 12. Um, and we are going to take these knowns that we've talked about already. Um, the uh, thi uh, 2 is about the quasi-permanent um, quasi loading, which is because this is a creep situation. Not going to jump into that. Just know that it's 0.3 and we can find that analysis. So if we just plug in our numbers then into our known equation, which is 3 over 385, and then we've got our W, which is our permanent load, way back at one of the first slides is 0.13 kilonewtons per meter. We can take, we know our span is 4.8. We're going to just put plug numbers in, and we've got our deflection due to flexure here, and then we're adding in our deflection due to shear at this point here. So we end up with an instantaneous um, permanent deflection of 1.2. We do exactly the same for the situation with um, instantaneous deflection for variable load. So our variable load um, was one kilonewton per meter that was acting on that member. Um, and then so we get that for our, per, um, our variable load in the um, flexure situation and then we add in the variable load for the shear deflection as well. And so we get a much bigger number of 9.2 mil compared to 1.2. But we'd expect that because obviously, in comparison, our, our permanent load is much smaller than our variable load. OK, so that makes sense. So adding these together is going to give us our overall instantaneous load. So um, we're going to be um, so it's kind of up at 10.4. Uh, millimeters for our um, overall. Um, but we also need to consider um, a kind of finished load, the crept, the crept load, as it were. And what we do with that is we take our instantaneous numbers that we've just worked out for deflection and we apply a multiplier of one plus K def, where, where we, we got the K def number as 0.8 um, for service class two. And then we add in um, a, a multiplier on the variable load. And because it's a variable load and it's not going to be there all the time, we get this big kind of quasi-permanent reduction factor of 0.3, this, this thi 2. Um, so total deflections, then um, we our, our finished deflection is thinking about this equation here. 
um, and we can see that it's 13.6, um, which is obviously a little bit more than that 10.4 that we talked about before, um, but that's not an issue. Um, that's to be expected because you've got that unrecoverable creep uh, deflection. So short term without creep uh, is the thing's going to deflect 10.4 mil. Now we need to analyze that against some sort of um, deflection limits. And the Euro code suggests for that instantaneous movement, we can look at the span over 300. So this is a little bit like our, our steel beam where we're looking at, say, span over 360 or something. You know, um, We take our uh, span, which is 4.8, we divide by 300. Our allowable deflection in this situation is 16 mil. Our, uh, what, how much the beam's going to deflect is 10.4. So thumbs up, we're OK uh, with that. Uh, we're within it. But we also now need to check this kind of total, including the creep. And um, the Eurocode gives us a little bit of leniency now. It says, OK, check it for span over 250. This is a lot, lot longer term situation. Um, we, we, we analyze that for its allowable movement, and it's 19.2 mil, so it's obviously a lot higher than the, slightly higher than the 16 mil that was given earlier. And we can then plug in what we have what we think it's going to move by, which is 13.6 in the long term with creep included, but we're still okay. So we've we've analyzed that. So that's our, that's our timber member, um, which is um, brilliant. I'm going to just going to talk about bearing for a little bit, Tabs, I know you've got an eye on time, um, <laughs> but that that really is that is the beam analysis. That's kind of Euro code. That's considering how we plug and use the formula and we look at the modification factors. I just want to talk a little bit about sort of bearing. So um, obviously when our timber beam sits on a support situation, you've got because it's isotropic, the whole thing, you've got it, it's going to work differently, the timber in, in different ways, the way that we apply the load. So um, in perpendicular to the grain, it's obviously a lot stronger than it is parallel to the grain. And we apply any loading support load um, to the member. We're really worried about these members crushing. So if you can see the top left hand situation is me kind of squashing that thing, those, those fibers, they're going to squash really uh, um, a lot more in that situation than they squash in the parallel to grain situation. So therefore, or importantly, we need to think, right, well, bearing is going to be a particular problem with timber, so it needs to be checked. So we do bearing checks and we need to think about how much of the timber sits on that support system. So um, again, Eurico 5 gives us kind of some clauses in 6115. Um, and if you read through that, you sort of understand that uh, you, you go back to, we're looking again at an applied bearing stress on the underside of that beam. So the kind of hatched area is the area that we're interested in. We can work out what that is. How much is it bearing on that wall? It's 100 mil, for example. And the width of it is the width of the joist, that's 75 mil. Um, and so therefore, we worked out the shear in the previous ex bit of exercise, and we found that the shear was 4.1 um, kilonewtons. Um, and all we're doing, we're, we're making this back into Newton so we can find our answer in Newton per millimeter squared. So it's all about unit conversion. So if we do that, we, we, we find that the applied bearing stress at that point on the underside of that timber is 0.55 Newtons per millimeter squared. That's important to know because we want to know if is it going to crush under that load or can our, can our timber take that bearing stress? So we need to, to look at a bearing strength effectively. And Eurocode, again, gives us some nominal compression perpendicular to the grain, which again is that table one. And it, uh, there's an allowance of 2.2 newtons per millimeter squared. So you can see we're already higher than what we're applying, 0.55. So the, the only things that are going to change that are any modification factors that affect our, our bearing strength. And the bearing strength factors are the K-SIS enhancement and the K-MOD. Um, and also something called KC90, which allows for some enhancement of the bearing. Because in actual fact, it's not just that area that's really coming into contact in terms of a shear situation. You've got lots of this grain all running in this that direction. 
and therefore you can take a little bit of enhancement. The load is going to share a little bit and come away from that bearing. So therefore you can, for a solid timber where you are on a concentrated load, you can take 1.5. If it's a continuous, um, if it's going over as a continuous beam over support, it's um, you can take another enhancement as well. It's slightly different, but again, reference the code. It's part four in 611, uh, 613. Um, if we plug in the numbers, the known numbers, K mod we know is 0.8, K6 is 1.1. Our KC90 is 1.5 defined for us. And we know we've got to take some material safety factor 1.3. So we're gonna um, we're gonna analyze that. And in actual fact, it ends up being exactly the same. It ends up being 2.2. So these things are sort of canceling each other out in a way. Um, so we get the nominal compression perpendicular to grain uh, is exactly our bearing strength is 2.2, and that's greater than what's being applied in terms of bearing stress. So in bearing, thumbs up, we're okay. We're, we're good with our bearing checks. I am going to, Tabs, if it's all right with you, we've got eight minutes left. I can, I'm just going to blitz through this in a minute, but the, these will be available. And I hope that it's quite self-explanatory that you guys can go through it. But it, but the unrestrained situation is exactly the same as the restrained situation. So the unrestrained beam situation is where you've got the member that's not restrained in the same way that the top compression flange is not restrained. So this could be a column here coming down on this, and this has the ability to kind of rotate that that top flange is not restrained. Um, so a good situation is probably where we've got a point load acting on the member. Um, and what we're interested in is there's a reduction factor again, there's a K crit reduction factor. And that K crit factor depends on a few things and you have to go for a few checks to get to K crit. So this, you, you, you have to do um, your relative slenderness check, you have to do a, a stress crit check and you have to look at your uh, effective length. Um, so suffice to say, the Eurico gives quite a nice formula to find um, uh, the the, um, the bending, the critical bending moment, uh, which involves this formula here for a rectangular softwood section. For um, for a glue lamb, it's slightly different, and you can do a much longer um, analysis as well, a much more accurate analysis as well, for different situations. Um, but just to say, um, you can plug in those numbers and. You, what you're interested in is getting to a point where you find the relative slenderness. So we all know that slenderness is about buckling and you don't want your member to buckle. And therefore, when you've got a relative slenderness, you can look at um, the situations here in terms of is my number bigger or less than 0.75? Is it less than one? You can you can basically analyze it for uh, what your K crit number is. And it generally, um, it's going to be a reduction number that you get with a critical because it's that lateral torsion. It's going to fail locally before it gets to its full strength. So sorry, we're tight on time, but I, will, I want to finish there, Tabs, so that at least you can fire some some nominance of questions to me. Um, and we will share. We will obviously share this. If shall I stop sharing and we jump back in? Yeah, no, that's absolutely great. You haven't. Thank you so much. That was, okay. you know. Even I, as a non-engineer, understood, you know, some of it and really picked up Absolutely. some, you know, really useful information. We have had actually, you know, a plethora of questions. Um, okay. So I will jump into them and obviously, um, you know, just quick answers. There we yeah. go. Um, Eric Mackay, um, should you not use plain timber sizes? So obviously, when you're talking about 225, yeah. you know, they're obviously a bit smaller. Yeah, they're than nominally that. a bit smaller. Yes, mm -hmm. that is a really good uh, thought and uh, a thing to add actually um, I will definitely be thinking of that when I'm talking to my students next but normally actually I would I would kind of precursor this with a talk on standard section sizes and that would be your go-to straight away when you're trying to take some guesswork at what size it is yes do your do your section size <laughs> it's only going to be really nominal but if you want to be really accurate with it absolutely fine brilliant and when you're visually grading you can actually remove up to 10 mil all round so it's you know it's, it's actually already designed in um 
we, we will be covering iJoyce's questions on iJoyce and how does the um, size uh, effect apply to non-rectangular timber members, but we will be coming to um, engineered timber yeah. in another talk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Sam has asked, how is the reduced shear area resulting from cracks in timber 0.67 taken into account in the deflection check? Ah, really? well, it, well, that's a good one, but it, 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 it isn't. Um, that's the answer. It isn't. Mm. But um, because I think really it's all those nominal elements kind of um, moving between each other. Um, and so you don't have to um, you don't have to consider it. It's only considered within that that shearing effect, um, which is different to what the, what's happening with the beam when it's deflecting. Um, and it is normally only that outside for checking and, and, and kind of and thermal shrinkage and movement of for, for it basically but good question thanks Ravi. Uh, thanks um, thank you sam uh, Gavin. um ravi excuse me i've shortened your name um can you explain the difference between these two uh, the means modulus of elasticity parallel to bending and the means modulus of elasticity perpendicular to bending um you will use each one differently depending on uh which way you're looking at applying the analysis to basically. So in this situation where you've got strength um, with the perpendicular, um, you're interested in the perpendicular, then you're looking at it in that situation. And that's what you look, that's why you're using that one. And the mean, and obviously you get the 5% or you get the mean. And the important one is to think about the 5% is where you're taking it for strength because that's at the, the sort of bell curve that you look at in terms of analyzing lots of members of timbers. Um, you're, you're interested in that top 5% effectively and saying that's the driver for our, for our strength grading. Um, whereas on deflection, because it's not an ultimate limit state, it's not a problem of complete failure. It's just deflection and deflection's acceptable because it's not, um, it's not, uh, you've got break, you know, you've got cracking or something that might happen, but it's not uh, problems with loss of life when strength grading goes pop. Uh, so that's why you can take the mean. Yeah. So it's a little bit more lenient. Yeah, and, and there's so many, you know, different questions in here. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to, um, you know, miss the second part of that question and move on to an, another one. This is from Jasmine. Um, does the KH apply to glue lamb as well? Yes. Yep. Yeah, it does. So we uh, on the KH value, you can take anything that's less than 600. 600 mil is really the the kind of line in the sand for the uh, base timber. Um, and then when you look at that, if you've got something that's 500, you get a slight amount of en enhancement. Um, if you're over that, if you're 700 or whatever, over that 600, you won't really get the enhance any enhancement. So it'll just be one that you take. But uh, again, it's limited to 1.1 as an enhancement on glue lamb, whereas it's limited to 1.3 as an enhancement on the softwood. You remember your figures, Catherine. Brilliant. <laughs> that, that's only because I've just talked to it about 10 minutes ago, and that will go out of my head when we live. <laughs> yes, OK, um, and does K crit only apply to joists? No, um, K crit applies to uh, main beams. Um, we've just taken a joist as a simplest mm -hmm. example, but obviously all of that formula, all of that process works on a beam, whatever you're analyzing. OK, so so take those those the same credentials and the same tabulated information um, and you can apply that in, in exactly the same way. And honestly, it is Better one run. one one minute to two, and yeah. so we have more questions, Gavin. I'm going to send them on to you. If that's send okay. them to me, and I'll and I'll and, and I'll we'll, reply. Yeah, you that are would be great. an absolute thank star. You. Thank you. And thank you to Alad again for his drawings and for you know being on holiday and letting you present. Oh, amazing! You know, all on amazing. your own. Thank but you. Alad. Absolutely. You know, again, that really explains lots, lots. Um, so yeah, huge thank you to you both for um, preparing and sharing your knowledge with our um, participants and to the wider audience. Timber Development UK have a, all resources online for engineers. So if you're not already signed up, you know, please um, sign up and um, you know, search the, for the following or use the QR code. If you're a student watching this, we run an uh, interdisciplinary challenge. It will be around housing. So if you would like to work with architects, which we would love you to, you know, come and join in.
this is the second series, uh, second webinar of the series of seven. Um, so if you haven't yet signed up, come and join us. And next week, we will hear from Vicky Edmondson from Northumbria University and James Norman from the University of Bristol, also a prolific author, on designing timber columns. So with that, I'd love to say thank you, Gavin, a huge, huge thank thanks, you. Thanks, Tabs. Thanks. Um, it was great fun. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks all for joining us. And hopefully we will see you all next week. Thanks all.